as has been mentioned, we are in the study of the Gospel of Mark. So if you would, grab your Bible, a device by which to get into the Bible, and open up to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Mark's in the Old or New Testament? Good. This corner is the only one that knows. Okay. <laughs> New Testament, second book of the Bible in the New Testament. There are four Gospels in the New Testament, and each of those Gospels are not necessarily biographical sketches of Jesus. That's not their purpose. That's not their intent. Even one of the gospel writers makes this statement in his gospel that if it were to be recorded of all the things that Jesus taught and did, he said, I, I wouldn't suppose that all the books in the world would hold all that Jesus did. But each gospel account is given for a very specific purpose. And so we're going through the Gospel of Mark the entirety of this year. We started at the first part of the year, January, and it's our plan to kind of finish up right before the Christmas holidays. And we have been learning together about who. Starts with a J, ends with an S. Okay, now this side's got it as well. That's great. Yeah, we're learning about Jesus. Obviously, the Gospel accounts are about the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, the mission of Jesus that we... We, you and I, as believers in Jesus, are invited into now the commission of Jesus, the great commission of Jesus to make disciples, to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We just witnessed visually some of that together. And also, Jesus said, teaching, to teach them all the things that I've commanded you, that they would observe them, meaning this morning... We're not just kind of cozying up before the summer showers and getting in our sermon nap this morning. It's not the purpose of the sermon. But it's to learn God's word so that by faith we can live God's word. Charles Spurgeon, I was sharing this this morning with someone in a conversation, once said that, you know, it's faith in Christ because of what Jesus has done. It's through faith that we get to enter into heaven. It's all about him and trusting him. But he made this interesting statement. And it's through faith and walking with Jesus, obedience to him in our lives, where heaven comes to earth, so to speak. And like was read earlier from the book of Galatians, we have been given freedom in Christ to walk out this life with him as disciples, learners, followers, apprentices of Jesus. And as we learn his word this morning, it's my hope, my prayer, that there would be something that God's spirit speaks to you through his living and active word that you can choose to live out this week by faith, by faith. That's the purpose. That's the intent of why we study through God's word is to know him and to follow him on a journey called life. So this morning... We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. Our plan and our intention is to go through the first 26 verses, and I'll be reading and teaching from the, the New Living Translation this morning, more of a thought-for-thought -thought translation of God's Word. And my hope and prayer is that distractions would be minimalized in your heart and mind, that you would be able to take these next 87 minutes that will be in God's Word. No, don't worry, it won't be 87. <laughs> At least you're still awake. <laughs> but that you would take this time and make the most of it. Man, time goes by so fast. Don't allow these moments that we have together, gathered together to sing and learn, to pray and serve and, and give and sing, to be lost on you. Lean into God's Word. And may with an open heart as he speaks by his spirit, may he grant you something that you can say, you know what, Lord, I, I see that. I, I needed that correction. I needed that instruction. I needed that realignment. I needed that encouragement. I believe if your heart is open and God's word is open before you that he'll speak. So let's pray that he'll do that. Father, I thank you for this precious congregation. And Lord, I ask that by your grace and by your spirit, Lord, that you would minimalize anything that would distract or deter or take away from the opportunity to have a clean heart before you this morning. Give us minds that are ready to exercise, so to speak, Lord, ready to dive into your word. 
But Lord, I, I ask that you would make that transition, that 18 inches, as it's been said, that's the longest distance in life from head to heart. And Lord, that it would move to our hands, that our lives would be changed by your grace and by your spirit. Bless your people, Lord, as we open your word. Lord, grant me the ability to serve them well. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 8, verse 1. Let me read the first 10 verses to you. Mark records this for us. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, and the people, well, they ran out of food again, Mark tells us. So Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. And his disciples replied there in verse 4, How are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? And Jesus asked, Well, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground, and then he took the seven loaves. He thanked God for them broke them into pieces, and he gave them to his disciples who distributed the bread to the crowd. And a few small fish were found, too. So Jesus blessed these and told his disciples to distribute them. They ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men in the crowd that day, and Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. And immediately after this, he got into a boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha, which is also maybe known as Magdala. Now, I have a question here. Is this an example of maybe what you've heard before? Maybe you attended college or have watched some reels online or been exposed to a philosophy of religion class or considered different religious texts. And one objection to the Bible quite often that is given is don't you realize that there are so many contradictions in the Bible? So my question is, is this one of those examples? I mean, if you've been with us for the last, I don't know, two months or so, this may sound very familiar to you. If you go back just a couple chapters and look at chapter 6, you, is Mark repeating himself and getting a little fuzzy the second time around? I mean, there's a lot of similarities to what Mark describes in chapter 6 and here in chapter 8, but there are a few differences. The miracle that's known commonly as the feeding of the 5,000, which, you know, is 5,000 men. That, that's who's referenced there. They, they had their wives and their children. Could have been up to fifteen to, to 20,000 people. Well, that miracle that's recorded for us in Mark 6, it's interesting. Anyone ever heard of the resurrection of Jesus? Have you guys heard about that? That's in every single gospel account. Don't you think it should be? Yeah. Did you know there's only one other miracle... That's in every single gospel account, and it's the feeding of the 20,000, the feeding of the 5,000. What we read about a couple months ago in Mark chapter 6. Well, here in Mark chapter 8, it's commonly known as the feeding of the what? Let's see if you're still awake. You, you guys are there. You're so much more on point than second service. Don't tell them that, but you are. The feeding of the 4,000. Now, here's what's interesting. This account, this engagement that Jesus has, this, this outreach of compassion, is found only in this gospel, the gospel of Mark, obviously, and the gospel of Matthew. There are some striking similarities between these two, two episodes. It's a deserted setting. Jesus, once again, has a heart for people. He's not obligated to do this, but out of compassion, he wants to feed them. The disciples, interestingly, have a very similar response of like, what? Like, what can we do? There's fish and chips, right? Bread and fish. 
There's leftovers. And we're left with this unexplainable miracle of multiplication that in no way can be explained rationally. I've heard attempts at this before. That, that people would say, well, you know, in those days, the clothing that people would wear, it would have big folds in it. And so sometimes they would keep extra bread or extra fish. I'm like, I don't think the mamas want to do that on laundry day. Like, okay, like you're fishing. No, no, that's not what's happening there. The, the intent of this is very clear. Wow, look at what Jesus did. How did this happen? There's a lot of similarities between the feedings that happened, so to speak, of the five and the 4,000. Both of these accounts clearly show Jesus is compassionate and capable. There's a whole sermon in that. But there's some notable differences, too. Mark chapter 6, the crowds were just with him for a day. Here this morning in Mark chapter 8, they're with him for three days, okay? Okay. In chapter 6, it's like Jesus tells his disciples to feed them, and, and so they go out and try and find as much food as they can. Here in chapter 8, Jesus kind of gives a similar anticipation, but they're kind of ready for it in a sense. They know how much bread they have. Mark 6, it's, it's springtime. Jesus has them sit very orderly in groups of, five, uh, of 50 and 100 on green grass is what Mark tells us. But here, they're just told to sit on the ground. It's summertime. With the 5,000, there were five loaves and two fish. Here in Mark 8, there's seven loaves. And it kind of seems like as things are happening, they find some fish and they begin to pass it around. And in Mark 6, it's interesting. He records for us that they pick up 12 baskets of leftovers. And the baskets there are almost like lunch baskets. Here in chapter 8, they pick up seven large laundry hampers of food, large enough to hold a man. Obviously, these are your two different accounts. And what's interesting about this, especially for us that are situated in like the, the 21st century, kind of over inundated with cinematic movies go, going by the name of Marvel or DC where it seems like it's so hard. to You have to get a PhD in Marvel to even know what's going on anymore with all these storylines. There's so many storylines that are like, okay, let's just invent the multiverse, where we're like, okay, how, how can you stay with all that? Well, why do I say that? It's interesting. Storytelling usually follows a pattern where each section kind of tops the previous section, right? This seems a little weird. 4,000 is less than 5,000. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. So what's the deal? Why, why would Mark, if this isn't a biographical sketch of Jesus, seeking to kind of sandwich everything that happened in the life of Jesus into an account, why does he select this miracle? Only Matthew does it. What's the importance of this? Why does he draw attention to this? Why is this here? Well, I want to submit to you that this morning, we'll kind of consider a little bit of the why in just a moment. We'll see Jesus refer back to this with his disciples in kind of a more like one-on-one -on -one intimate discussion he has with them as they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. But there is this familiar point that this miracle drives home. In fact, we've already considered this point. You see, this miracle in chapter 8 it follows what chapter? Seven, right? There, there's two miracles in chapter seven that are actually strung together with this one. Jesus freeing the woman's daughter who had demonic possession and the deaf and mute man. See, these three miracles go together. One author said this. He said, why did Matthew and Mark include two miracles of the same kind? After all, if Jesus already fed 5,000 people, what is really added to the gospel story by including a second feeding of a smaller number? It seems odd. Wouldn't it have been better to use that precious ink and parchment to record some other miracle? It says, here's the answer. The answer is location, location, location. Anyone ever bought real estate? You've heard that phrase? Yeah. Why is this in here? 
Jesus is still, if you'll remember from last week, in Gentile territory, just as with the woman's daughter who, who, who was asking Jesus, listen, can, can you heal my little girl? And Jesus has this interesting interaction with her where very commonly when Jews spoke of Gentiles, they would use the word dog to describe who they are as like these scavenging individuals. And Jesus makes this statement when she's begging him to heal her daughter. He says, listen, I, I can't give to the children and forsake them. I can't feed the children after I feed the little puppies, so to speak. And she hears that word. Puppies. Okay, you didn't use the word that I'm so familiar with hearing from Jewish individuals about my kind, the scavenging dogs. And she attaches her faith to that and says, but Jesus, even the little puppies catch the crumbs. You know, last week I saw a guy in our church, Kent Vansel, posted this image after Sunday morning on his social media reel from like an, an old album cover. And it's this little child grabbing crumbs from the table. And he made this interesting statement. We're grafted into his grace. That's what this story teaches. That, that, that the gospel's for the whole world. See, why is this feeding of the 4,000, why is it in here? Jesus is in Gentile territory. There's this woman who in the mind's eye of most Jewish individuals could not be more far removed from God and a touch from God. And she has this interesting encounter with Jesus where Jesus says, listen, I've got to feed the kids before I give puppies any crumbs. And she attaches her faith to that little open door that Jesus gives her. And she says, but, but Jesus, even the puppies eat the little crumbs. And he says, your answer is good. Your daughter's been healed. And then we read about this encounter that Jesus has with a man who's mute and deaf and because of his love, he reaches out and gets on the level of this man's world. Do you remember that from last week? Because it's a very peculiar healing of Jesus. Jesus sees this man who cannot speak, cannot hear, and he gets very visual with him. He, he takes his fingers and he puts them in his ears. He takes spit and touches his tongue. And he uses this Aramaic word, ephaphatha, and get the picture. He gets this man one-on-one -on -one who cannot hear, who cannot speak, and he takes his fingers. And they're not wet willies. He's just taking his fingers, putting them in his ears, and he's visualizing to him, I'm here to help. He takes saliva, which you go, what, what? Saliva in that culture, it was thought to have medicinal value. So the man sees what Jesus is doing. He's touching my ears. He's touching my tongue. And he says a word, ephaphatha. Ephaphatha. Maybe he's saying it like this. Can't hear it, but this man can see it. And so what's the point? Jesus is in Gentile territory. Does he need to be there? If he's just solely come to pay our debt that we owed, because we owed a debt that we could never pay, what's he doing in Gentile land? I'll tell you what he's doing. He has a heart of compassion to get on level with anyone and everyone who will open their hearts to him. And, and with the woman at the table, he's given her this little opening. Even the puppies, she goes, oh, I hear what you're saying. Jesus, they eat the crumbs because your, your daughter's healed. Th this deaf and mute man, Jesus heals the man. Jesus is after everyone, after everyone. Someone made this note about this, this section that I thought was interesting. One author said, you know, numbers in the Bible are, are rarely accidental. The feeding of the 5,000, there were five loaves to feed the 5,000. And it's interesting. The setting of that miracle is in Galilee. In Galilee. Twelve baskets of leftovers alludes to the 12 tribes of Israel. The, the, most obviously, the 12 disciples. But five also set yourself in the sandals of a Jewish male of one of those 5,000. When you heard the name five, you always went back in your mind to the Torah, the first five books of the law. They would memorize Torah as young Jewish boys. Memorize Leviticus. That's your homework this week. Like, th that was ingrained in their culture. So what does the feeding of the 5,000 show us? He's for the Jew. 
The, the feeding of the 4,000, seven loaves are used. Seven baskets are collected. Seven is often throughout Scripture symbolic of completeness. It's also reminiscent of seven days of creation. What's the point? Why is Jesus touching the tongue and healing the ears and using a word that could be seen? Why is he opening up this door to this Gentile woman? Why is he feeding these 4,000 individuals who are primarily not Jewish? Let me share with you why. Here's why. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone, can you say that word with me? Everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Here's why. For you are all children of God because you're Americans. No, it's not what it says. You are all children of God. How? How does this happen? Through faith in Christ who, church? Jesus. And all who have been unified with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. It's like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Those standings, male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. He's not saying, obviously, they have no significance, they don't matter, but then nowhere are they barriers for you in coming to Christ. The foot of the cross is level. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You're his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Like Paul would say in Ephesians, I pray from his glorious unlimited resources that he would empower you with the inner strength through his spirit that Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him that your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong God's love and keep you strong and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should what how wide how long, how high, how deep his sovereignty is, his majesty is, his mysterious, awesome power, how deep his love is. That's what I want you to get, if Paul would say to the church. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Why? Why? Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Is it important to understand as much as an ant can understand the internet, I guess you would say, about the sovereignty and mystery and power of God? Absolutely. But his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In some ways, trying to understand all of that is like an ant trying to relate to the internet, which maybe one day with AI we're on our way there. You know, who knows? But here's the point. This is what Paul would say. This is the reason for the feeding of the 4,000. God's love. God's love. You know, the point is to know that God's love is not reserved for a select few, but for everyone. And please listen to this. Knowing his love, please catch this. Don't miss this. Don't tune out on this. Knowing his love. Knowing his love is the secret sauce that makes life sweet in a salty world. Knowing that he loves you. You know, we do a, a staff meeting as a, as a staff of our church here every day that we're in the office. We get together at 9 o'clock. We, we watch the daily in the word devotional. You know, our church has made a strong commitment to helping our congregation understand God's word by not only giving a reading plan each day of the week, weekday, but also a two-minute video devotional. And, and as a staff, we, we take in that devotion. We share a little bit about what's going on in the life of our church, if there's health needs or individuals that are in the hospital that need to be prayed over. And when we break into small groups to pray with one another and for you. But once a month, once every six weeks or so, we do an extended staff meeting. And in that staff meeting, we talk through all the things that are going on in the life of our church, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time 
kind of refreshing what we're learning together on Sunday mornings. And some of those points from last week about the love of God, we spent some time as a staff learning a little bit more about that. And I referenced something in that staff meeting that I want to share with you. And this isn't new content that you've never heard me share before, but I don't think you should ever graduate from God's love. Henry Blackaby wrote this book back in the 90s. Anyone remember the 90s? That was a great era. Anyone? Okay. Maybe it was the 90s. Maybe it could have been the 80s, even a better era, right? Karate Kid. No, I don't know. But he wrote this book that I recently re-listened to, and he made this statement that I want to read to you. God created us to work. No. God created us for a love relationship with him. When you're not living your life in the overflow of God's love for you and your love for him, then you cannot live the Christian life as it's intended. Hopefully in your mind's eye, you're referencing back to what Paul wrote in Ephesians. I'm praying that you would know God's love. If you cannot describe your relationship with God by saying that you love him with all of your being, then before you do anything else, you need to entreat the Holy Spirit to bring you into that kind of relationship today. Everything in your Christian life, he says, everything about knowing God and experiencing him, everything about knowing his will depends on the quality of your love relationship with God. If this relationship is not right, nothing in your life will be in order. If you don't know who you are, that you're loved by God, he says this, do you realize that the Lord doesn't just give you life. He is your life. He doesn't just grant you things and comfort so that you can have a good life, but he brings you into a relationship with him so that out of that relationship, you can have everything you could possibly need. What is the foremost thing God wants from you? He wants you to love him with all of your being. Your experiencing God depends on your love for him. And let me ask you a question, church. This is a Bible verse question. We love him because he, God is the initiator of this relationship. And if there's some dynamic, some disconnect where there's not that love relationship, it's not, God hasn't moved. He, he's still on the other line. It's kind of positioning your heart on this side of eternity through trusting him, walking with him where you experience that love relationship with him. Jesus said it very clear. If you love me, here's what will happen. You'll obey me. There is this mysterious, intricately connected reality to experiencing God's love to the fullest on this side of eternity by just walking with him as a disciple, not just becoming a CEO. What? What? Christmas and Easter only. That's when I show up to church, right? <laughs> like, it's not about a religious got to. It's about a relationship with him. It's like Spurgeon said, faith in Christ is what brings you to heaven. Absolutely. You don't earn your way. To, no. But, but you want to experience heaven on earth. There's an element of faith and obedience walking with him. Walking with him. Don't miss this simple but transformational truth of the love of God. That's what's on display in Jesus feeding the 4,000. And now he gets on a boat, crosses the sea. And because Jesus is so loving and, and amazing and miraculous, and he's greeted with a warm and loving welcome, right? Look at verse 11. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him, testing him, demanded that, they show, that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. Hostility from the Pharisees. They, they came out kind of almost like militantly, ready to engage in battle, to argue, to test, trying to trip him up, not there to discover truth. And his authority. I mean, how many of you guys, and just we'll just do this by a show of hands, have heard of the gospel, Mark? Have you been going through it with us for at least the last couple of months? Let me ask you a question. Is there anything in the gospel of Mark that seems to prove his authority? 
Yeah. I mean, it's like over and over and over and over and over again. It's like, did you hear about his baptism? An audible voice came down. I mean, over and over and over and again. So what's going on here? You know, it says that they demanded a sign. And that word for a sign, it's like apocalyptic literature, meaning something like, Jesus, we want you to write something in the sky. One author said this, they were asking Jesus to prove who he was by doing something like blocking the sun, turning the moon plaid, or making starry constellations spelled LWJD. Look at what Jesus just did. I thought, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a show. I mean, over and over and again, he's authenticated who he is. But these religious leaders, they're not like others who place their faith in Jesus or seeking him genuinely. Jesus showed compassion to so many in miraculous ways. You know, we've seen the religious leaders. They would attribute what he did to the work of Satan. Well, he casts out demons by the work of Satan. Or they knew that according to Mosaic law, they could accuse him of false preaching and put him to death. That's their heart's motivation. But Jesus, look at what it says in verse 12. He knows their minds, so he said when he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit and he said, why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth. I will not give this generation any such sign. Again, the 90s, he's like, homie, don't play that, right? That's what he basically says. And that sigh, it could be, a, it could be interpreted as a sigh of pity. It's the same kind of word that's used of like groaning. So it says in verse 13, he got back in the boat and he left them. And I don't want that to be ever said of me. He left them. He crossed to the other side of the lake. But the disciples, they had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. And when they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out. Beware of the yeast that the Pharisees and of Herod. And so they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. The disciples forget to bring some food. They only brought one loaf of bread. And you would think like a loaf of bread. I mean, I have six kids. That gets us through lunch. But think pita bread, you know, one little pita bread. And Jesus says, beware. Your translation may say leaven or yeast. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And they think the Messiah is mad. <laughs> Pete, you forgot the pita. Like, they start arguing. And as we'll see in just a moment, he's not, he's not talking about a missed meal, but missing the point. You see, throughout the Bible, yeast and leaven illustrates that evil spreads quickly. And it's small and hidden, but when it spreads, here's the deal, it infects the whole thing. And Jesus is speaking about the persistent unbelief that he encounters with the Pharisees. And he even mentions of Herod, the Herodians. Now, in Matthew's gospel, leaven and yeast is referred to as false teaching. In Luke, this is called hypocrisy. And it's interesting. You know what the Herodians did? They sought to change the spiritual temperature of their culture, of their nation, by political means. One author put it this way, while the Pharisees and Herod seem to have little in common, Jesus describes them both as having leaven, a toxic flaw that can infect others. Given the context, this flaw is probably failure to believe even after being confronted with the truth, and Jesus is warning his disciples not to fall victim to that same lethal attitude. And they don't get it, right? And so Jesus says in verse 17, he knew what they were saying, so he said, why are you arguing about not having bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. Don't you remember anything at all? It says, guys, your hearts, your eyes, your ears have grown dull to the truth. I so appreciate and respect the teaching ministry of Pastor Skip Heitzig. He says this, followers of Jesus can have hardened hearts. It can happen. When you fail to remember God's mercy to you in your spiritual history, here's what's happening. Your heart is susceptible 
to hardening. And you can become entitled and bitter. These guys are so close to Jesus, and yet they miss it. And so here's what he does. Remember when I shared with you that we'd kind of come back to the meaning of this miracle of feeding the 4,000? Jesus, look at what he does, verse 19. He says, when I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up? They said 12. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets did you pick up? They, seven. That's what they said. And so he asked this simple question. Do you, don't you understand yet? The feeding of the 4,000, it evidences for sure God's love. Most definitely his compassion and capability. That he knows all, sees all, can do all, and he has a heart to care. But Jesus very intentionally, while they're on the boat talking about the missed opportunity for pita bread, says, guys, don't you remember the 5,000? Don't you remember the 4,000? Well, what's the point? I mean, if it went from 5,000 in Galilee and 4,000 in Gentile country, was the Messiah mojo just not as potent in that Gentile country? What's the point? Here's the point. Don't miss this. The outcome of his miracle wasn't dependent upon the material he had to work with, but upon the power of God. Jesus wasn't following some kind of magic formula. He wasn't depending on some undiscovered law of science to produce food. Here's the point. He was dependent only upon the power of God. One loaf was just as good as having a thousand, and he could work the miracle with either one. See, one author described it this way. He said, the disciples had no reason to be concerned with the fact that they only had one loaf when the giver of bread was there himself. Rather, they should be concerned with the Lord's enemies and the false doctrines they taught. These, not the lack of bread, were the true threat they faced. This miracle of feeding the multitude was performed twice. Moreover, there was a reason it was performed twice. Through its repetition, the Lord taught an important lesson about himself and his power to the disciples that could not have taught them if he'd only worked this miracle once. Well, okay. Working this miracle twice served a divine purpose, and that's the reason it was repeated. What's the divine purpose? I'm going to give you a very long theological definition and description. Here it is. Trust God. That's the point. Trust God. At the risk of being accused of reading too much Bible in church, I want to read a lot of Bible to you for a moment. There's two points, two takeaways that I hope you glean from our time in God's Word this morning. They're very simple. One is the love of God. We've spent ample time unpacking that a little bit this morning. But the second is to trust God. Again, at the risk of reading too much Bible in church, which I don't know if is a thing, but I want to read to you some words of Jesus. These aren't going to be up on the screen. They're from Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read from verses 19 through 34. But I would ask that these words would impact your heart. Listen to what Jesus says. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your whole body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one, listen to the words of Jesus, dear church. No one can serve two masters. For you'll either hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God 
and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds, he says. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. And your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat and drink and what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Know that God loves you and trust him. Don't graduate from those truths. Know that God loves you and he's worthy of your trust. As we close this morning, we're going to consider just one more account from Mark chapter 8. It's unique to this gospel. It's nowhere else found in the Bible. It's an account of healing. And it's interesting as we close this morning how this healing, in context of what we're reading throughout the Gospel of Mark, well, how it pairs with an important lesson and how the disciples are slow to get it. Verse 22, it says that when they arrived at Bethsaida, some of the people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. And Jesus, he does something just like he did, you know, back in chapter 7 with the man who was deaf and couldn't speak. It says in verse 23 that he took the, the man that was blind by the hand and he led him out of the village, kind of away from the crowds. And here's Jesus. Look at what he's doing again. Spitting. Spitting on the man's eyes. He laid his hands on him and said, can you see anything now? Is it working? Can you see? Verse 24, the man looked around and he said, yes, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. So Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again and his eyes were open and sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. And Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Remember, each gospel is not necessarily an overview of all of Jesus' life. This is here for a very specific reason. This man is healed, couldn't see, now he can. Why is this placed alongside everything else that we're reading? Something very interesting about this is this is the only miracle recorded. Again, it's only recorded in the gospel of Mark, but it's the only one where the healing happens progressively in stages. If the man's vision at first is blurred. He kind of sees like people walking around like trees. And then, then after Jesus lays his hands on him, he sees everything clearly. And remember, once again, Jesus is reaching the man on his level using saliva, which was thought to have medicinal value at that time. Why does Mark place this right here? Well, the disciples, Jesus just said to them, man, you have eyes, but you don't see. You have ears, but you don't hear. They're struggling with a sense of spiritual blindness. He wanted them to see and be leery, to be watchful for unbelief. Not trusting God is like leaven. It's small, but when it spreads, it affects your whole life. It's like a lens that you put over your eyes. And that lack of trust in God or that lack of confidence in God's love begins to make fuzzy everything else in life. The point is to trust God. 
Can I ask you to be honest in church for a second? Have you ever struggled with doubting that God loves you or struggled with trusting in God? I mean, that back section, you guys are awesome. You never doubt it. <laughs> I think if we're honest, there's this dynamic in life as you walk through life where you go, God, do you see? Do you care? Can I trust you? Due to the time that we have this morning, we won't be studying the rest of chapter 8. And many of you go, thank God, we're not saying that's a lot to study. But as you read the next few verses, here's what's so interesting about this chapter. Many Bible commentators call the, the middle section of chapter 8 the continental divide of the Gospel of Mark. It's where the disciples will confess who Jesus is as the Christ, and it's one of the most powerful sections of the whole Gospel. And next week, Pastor John will open up that text to us. But they make a few mistakes in understanding Jesus' mission, and it's like they see him partly, but, but Jesus is working hard to give them full clarity and vision of who he is. And I just want to ask this question. Isn't that the case for many of us? Where sometimes the love of God and, and the ability to trust God, we can get a little fuzzy with that sometimes. And Jesus is constantly calling us to clarity on those simple truths that I love you and you can trust me, that I love you and you can trust me. Kind of reminds me of the lyrics from this old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Listen, as we close this morning, here's my hope. My hope is that the truths from God's word would form the very foundation of your lives. And here are two ingredients to a firm foundation. Number one, God's love. Knowing his love is the secret sauce, the secret sauce that makes life sweet in a salty world. And God's love leads us to a place where we can trust God. Remember, the outcome of these miracles weren't dependent upon the material God had to work with, but upon the power of God. You ever felt like, well, Lord, I just don't have enough. I'm not enough. It's not dependent upon the material he had to work with, but upon the power of God. May we keep our eyes on him that's how we'll see everything else clearly in life. God, I can trust you. I can trust you. And I want to encourage you this morning. I kind of encouraged you with this as we started our Bible study this morning. To make the most out of this Sunday morning. You know, if you've read any of our welcome materials to the church, if you've kind of walked from this glass corridor over to the coffee house and you've seen those 10 values that are on the windows over there. We talk about we value singing to God. We value praying. We value fellowship. We value communion. We value serving one another. We value giving. Listen, we gather together on a Sunday morning. We give and we serve. We fellowship. We pray. We learn God's word. We give towards his kingdom. But if you're not careful... You can kind of slip into this rut of church and allow it to just become sitting, standing, singing. And that's what church is. Well, I, I sit and listen, and I, I sing a little bit, and I, I sit a lot. And that's what church is. Don't let church start and stop with just singing and sitting. You've heard me say this so many times. Billy Graham often said one of the most dangerous things in America to do is to just listen to a sermon, to just take it in and then go and live your life the same way as if you ever did before. The, the point of the sermon, the point of listening and learning God's word is that it would bring transformation in our lives. Why do I share this? I hope you're benefiting from singing and giving and serving and learning this morning, but also fellowshipping together and praying with and for one another. It's part of the reason we're here. See, some of us need a reminder to just know that God loves us and a reminder to trust God with right where we are in this season of life. And hopefully, 
a sermon is helpful to that. Hopefully, as we, as we spend time in God's word, there's clarity, there's, there, there's instruction, there's, there's correction, there's realignment. But also, God does that in conversations with people. As we close this morning, I want to ask you to lean into fellowshipping with one another and praying for one another. You know, we do prayer teams every Sunday morning at the end of the service. That's not just because we can't think, well, how should we close? I know what we'll do. We'll just put some people up front. That's a good way to close it out. I believe prayer is powerful. I believe many times we, we don't have because we don't ask. And I believe that all of us are in need to be prayed for sometimes and to just partner in prayer. I love that last Sunday as a congregation, we were able to spend a little bit of time praying for a little boy who's been battling a very tough disease for the last two years. Friday, we just got a report that his most recent surgery went very well. He's in a lot of pain, but his family is so encouraged to know that he has a congregation of people praying with and for that precious family. This week, as I kind of previewed some of the social media interactions on their profile, it was so encouraging to see so many of you reaching out to them, saying, we're praying for you. Remember last week when we considered that woman who was asking Jesus to heal her daughter? We made this simple statement. What would have happened if she would have done nothing? Assumed that, well, he's a rabbi, I'm a Gentile woman, I could never... He's in town 40 miles away from his home area. I don't want to bother him. I wasn't even invited to come see him. What would have happened if she would have done nothing? Nothing. But because she reached out, her daughter was healed. As we close this morning, the points of application are pretty simple. Hey, know that God loves you and trust him. Pretty simple. But maybe just like those disciples, sometimes those things can get a little fuzzy. I want to encourage you as we close this morning to fellowship with one another, to come and be prayed for. In just a moment, we'll, we'll sing in a chorus. We'll even sing a prayer over one another that God would be with us as we go. But as you go into this week, I hope you know, as Paul prayed for the Christians in Ephesus, how much God loves you. It's deep, it's wide, it's high. It's and that he's worthy of your trust. And this morning, don't just let it be sitting and learning, sitting and singing. Fellowship together. Encourage one another. Be prayed for. Pray for one another.